You can open your Bibles to Matthew, the 12th chapter. <clears throat> Matthew, the 12th chapter. Thank you, Lord. We've been doing an extended series on faith, walking by faith, and uh, God put this thought in my heart for last week, Matthew 12, verse 33, either make the tree good and its fruit good or else to make the tree bad and its fruit bad, for a tree is known by its fruit. Brood of vipers, how can you being evil speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. A good man out of the good treasure of his heart brings forth good things. And an evil man out of the evil treasure brings forth evil things. Amen. So we talked about the abundance of the heart. What's coming out of your mouth? Is it faith? Is it something else? Is it doubt, unbelief, fear? Amen. Each tree is known by its fruit. Amen. What are you putting in your heart in abundance? And then we talk some, if you turn to Romans, the eighth chapter. We made a contrast between two things. Romans 8 and verse 5, For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. But those who live according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. For to be carnally minded, the mind of the flesh is death. But to be spiritually minded is life and peace or the mind of the Spirit's life and peace. So we, you have two basic choices in how to live. You can live with the mind of the flesh, set your mind on the things of the flesh, and of course the flesh is referring to the nature of sin in our bodies and generally being primarily moved and motivated by the five senses of the body, which is contrasted then by the second way to live, and that's the mind of the Spirit. This is the union of our born-again human spirit with the Holy Spirit now living within us, setting our renewed minds to think on these things and on that plane or on that level. Amen. Then so we talked about some characteristics that make both of them, uh, make up both of them. The mind of the flesh, look at verse 6, you know, it says, to be, the mind of the flesh is death. It's going to cause separation. Amen. I've watched people. I've watched people that start walking with God. Amen. Excited about God. On fire for God. And over a period of time, they gradually slip back into the mind of the flesh. And there's a separation that goes on. A separation from God and back to the world. And we began to see them less and less. And that's why, you know, when people, when I don't see people, I call them up because, I mean, that process. I, I mean, I was thinking of one particular woman when she first started coming. I mean, she even purchased a van so she could t bring more people to church. Amen. Very committed. Very involved. And gradually. Ever so gradually. Instead of Sunday mornings and Wednesday nights, it was just Sunday mornings. And then it was some Sunday mornings. And then it was a very scattered amount of Sunday mornings. And then it was maybe once every other month. Then it was maybe twice every six months. And then it was 
maybe twice a year. And now we don't see her at all. And when I call her up, she's cold toward me. And the last time I called, God said, just leave her be. Just leave her be. She's made her choice. Very sad. Very, very sad. The mind of the flesh can cause a gradual separation. I think it was casting crowns that talked about, you know, the slow process. What do they call it? A slow burn? What was it? Slow fade. That's the, thank you. Slow fade. It was a slow fade. Amen. And people began to fade away from God and toward the things of the world, the things of the flesh, until they're back, you know, almost totally in the world. Amen. And then we, we saw here that uh, mind of the flesh is enmity against God. You, be, you begin to become an enemy of God. You begin to be an enemy of the things of God. And then we saw in verse 7 that the mind of the flesh is not subject to the law of God. In other words, to love, to the word of God, all the principles of the word of God. It does not submit itself to God when in disagreement. And then we saw that, you know, they that are in the flesh cannot please God. They can't please God, you know, which means then Hebrews eleven six, without faith it is impossible to please God. So that, in other words, they began to walk by sight, not by faith. Amen. And, um, and then the mind of the spirit, as believers, we're not in the flesh, but in the spirit. Amen. Because we have the spirit of God in us. If we don't have the Holy Ghost, then we're, we're not His. When Christ is in us, the body is dead because of sin, but the Spirit is life because of righteousness. So li- the life of God draws you closer to God. Every day, life brings a unity, a, a union with God, a drawing together to the point where y- you are meshed with God. Like Paul said, we're one spirit with Him. Amen. But there, there, there becomes then a one mind with God. Amen. And we even train our body to begin to desire the things of God. Hebrews chapter 6 talks about, or chapter 5 says we can even train the body to want the things of God to a point because of the habits we, we uh, choose. If, we, if the Holy Spirit dwells on us, then the life-giving power within us will extend to our mortal or death-doomed bodies. Tapping into that Zoe life will cause us to rise above the nature of sin that is in our bodies. And we talked about verse 12, there were debtors to live after the Spirit. Amen. We're not debtors to God. Jesus paid that debt, but we're debtors to everyone else. Debtors to the Jews to tell them the good news. Debtors to the Gentiles, people without a covenant, to tell them the good news. Amen. We're debtors. And this is the second time that God said we're debtors. Romans 1.14 said, Paul said, I am a debtor to the Jew and to the Greek. I live my life here on earth under that shadow, realizing I have a debt to all who haven't heard the gospel. And then verse 14, we demonstrate our sonship when we're consistently led by the Holy Spirit. Consistently. And then verse 15, it's by the mind of the Spirit that we discover and experience God as Abba Father. And then verse 16, is in the mindset of the Spirit that the Holy Spirit bear witness to our spirit that we're the children of God. So if we put spiritual things in our heart in abundance, we can walk in the mind of the Spirit and The Bible says the mind of the Spirit is what? Two things. Life and peace. Amen. All all right. That's enough review. It is important for us to know which realm we're operating in. The word realm, God just started speaking that word to me, realm, defined, is the place the range 
or the extent of operation. Amen. Ever heard the phrase coin of the realm? No, no, you never heard that? Wow. That's interesting. Um, that refers to the extent of which that money in that particular kingdom uh, is legal tender. In other words, accepted coinage in that country's range of operation. Amen. Just like, you know, American dollars are welcome in a lot of different places, but not every place. Amen. It is important for us to know that there are different realms in which we can operate as believers. Some of these realms are scriptural, although many are not. Amen. Unbelievers naturally operate in the realm of sin and disobedience. Remember Ephesians 2? Turn over to Ephesians 2. Let me show you what I'm talking about. Verse 1, And you he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins. Notice, In which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now works in the sons of disobedience, among whom also we all conducted ourselves in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, were by nature children of wrath, just as the others. That was us. Children of disobedience. Children of wrath. Amen. Whereas we as believers are to operate in the realm of holiness and uprightness. We're to make sure we're operating in the correct realms according to our covenant. And there are many realms we could talk about but tonight I want to talk about just four that God put on my heart. Four realms we could operate in. Okay, the name of my message tonight for you in the sound booth is which realm are you in? Which realm are you in? Number one, the first one we're going to talk about is the faith realm. Turn to Romans 10. Romans 10 and verse 8. But what does it say? The righteousness which is of faith means is the it there. What does the righteousness which is of faith say? The word is near you in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith which you preach. That's what faith says. Remember the, the centurion? Speak the word only and my servant will be healed. And Jesus, what did Jesus say about him? I have not found so great faith, no, not in Israel. He understood the principle. Faith is in two places, in our mouth and in our heart. Amen. All right, as I talked about earlier in this faith series, we have, if you, if you were, the egg of faith in us at the new birth. And then 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 23. See, you know, we're, we're programmed by God to believe. Did you know that? People want to believe something, even if it's some stupid off-the-wall junk. Amen, it's true. 1 Peter 1, verse 20, having been born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, through the word of God which lives and abides forever. Amen. The word of God is the incorruptible seed that fertilizes the egg of faith on the inside of us. Faith has to be, we have to have faith to be saved from sin, and it comes by hearing a word of Christ. Look at verse uh, Romans 10. Well, you don't have to look there. This is a familiar scripture. Remember, it says, scripture, it says, um, so then faith comes by hearing, and that hearing by a word of Christ. Literally, that's what it says in the Greek a rhema of Christ, a, when the word of God, the logos, the, the written, just, just the bare word of God, and you read that, that's good, it's great, 
But when it really benefits you was when the word of God becomes a personal word to you. That's rhema. That's when it goes from your head to your spirit. And nobody can talk you out of it because you got the revelation of it. Glory to God. <laughs> and uh, when that happens, that's when faith is present. Look at Galatians 5. Galatians, the fifth chapter. Verse 22, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faith, gentleness, self-control. King, New King James says faithfulness, but it's literally faith. Against such there is no law. Amen. These are the fruit of our recreated, born-again human spirit in union with the Holy Spirit. So we have faith, then what are we going to do with it? Okay. And like I said, there's a confession onto faith and there's a confession of faith. All right? But we're just going to assume that you've gotten to the place where you have faith. What are you going to do with it? Once the word of God has become a personal word to you, in other words, gets from your head to your spirit, now what? Well, then faith is always in the present tense, isn't it? Faith is always now. Amen. If your believing is in the future, it's only what? Hope. And hope has no substance. Hebrews 11.1, 1, now faith is. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for. Hope is wonderful. We need hope because you've got to have hope in order. Remember, what's the definition of hope? Confident expectation of something good, of good things. Amen. You got to have hope, but hope without faith has no substance. It's just, it's always just way out there. It's always in the future. But faith brings it into the now. You need it now. You don't need it someday. You need it now. Amen. Faith then calls things that don't exist as though they do exist. We talked about that in one of our sessions. So things Jesus accomplished through his substitutionary sacrifice, his death, burial, and resurrection, all that happened before that he went to the cross, must be brought from past tense to present tense. Because he bought a lot of stuff for us. Amen. By Jesus' stripes we were healed. That's past tense. Amen. He died for us, was raised from the dead. He paid the price for our salvation, our new birth. Amen. For our deliverance, for our safety, for our soundness, for our wholeness, for our preservation. All the things that salvation includes. Amen. Jesus died for you, paid the price for your sins, and was raised from the dead. But then we have to take that and bring it into the present. Romans 10, 9. If you confess with your mouth Jesus as Lord and believe in your heart that God raised you from the dead, you shall be saved. It goes from in the past something that has been accomplished and you bring it into the now. Now. Now is the day of salvation. Not someday in the future. Well, I hope I get saved someday. Well, you, you, know, you, you do that, you can, you can die hoping. But it's believing that makes a difference. Faith must be in your mouth. The word of faith which we preach. Amen. Faith must be in your heart, in your spirit. Glory to God. And I've preached enough on that, so I'm going to get off of that one and go to the second realm, and that's the mental realm. The mental realm. Kenneth Hagin says this, if, you, if the devil can keep you in the mental realm, he can defeat you every time. That's why you have to be careful. My wife will confirm that, you know, I'm no dummy. I, I have a lot of knowledge, but I don't let knowledge get in the way. 
Amen. I do know a lot, don't I? Yeah. I mean, when we play Jeopardy, I'm always answering stuff that surprises her. Amen. I have an excellent memory, great recall, great comprehension. Always have. Always will. Amen. But if, if, if the devil can get you into the mental realm, because we always have two choices. We can be squeezed or pressured into thinking in the mold of the world. Remember Romans 12, 2, the first part of the verse? Be not conformed to this world. Don't be squeezed into the mold of the world thinking. In other words, who's engineering the thinking of the world? The devil is. You can see, man, now that, that all this stuff is going on, you can see how he's engineering it. And that's why we have to pray. That's why we have to believe. Because we're the ones, the Bible says in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, who are withholding the Antichrist and, and the devil setting up all of his stuff. I mean, you look at people like Napoleon was the devil's attempt to have the Antichrist come early. Hitler was the devil's attempt to get the Antichrist to come early and to circumvent the word of God, get the whole thing messed up. But thank God, God is greater. Amen. But God told us not to be squeezed into this mold, to think the way the devil wants us to. He doesn't want us to think that way because the pressure comes for us to think that way. This stinking thinking will lead to all of the ills of the world system. Dominance by the devil in your body, in your finances, in your circumstances. The devil will dominate you through this wrong thinking. Amen. Proverbs 23, 7 says, As a man thinks in his heart, so is he. As a man thinks in his heart, so is he. If you think you are sick, then that's what you are. Amen. If you think you are dying, then that's what you are. If you think you are poor, then that's what you are. If you think you're unworthy, then that's what you are. If you think you're defeated, then that's what you are. If you think you're worthless, then that's what you are. As a man thinks in his heart, so is he. Amen. And so on and so forth. You could just go on and on. And of course, he wants to get you to think his kind of thoughts. He'll come to you when you're standing for healing and say, he'll say to you, you don't really think you're healed, do you? Look at you. You're coughing and hacking and blowing your nose. And, and you know, you, you, your nose is stuffed up and, and you know, your lungs are, are, are full of junk. And, you know, you don't really think you're healed, do you? And what do you say to something like that? Mm. Ah, that's it. I tell the devil, I don't think I'm healed. I know I'm healed. And that's the way you got to talk to him. Sometimes I think the devil's hard of hearing. Turn to Genesis chapter 3. I want, you to, I want you to see how the devil operates. Genesis chapter 3, verse 1. Now the serpent was more cunning. We know that the devil, or the serpent allowed the devil to inhabit him and work through him. That's why God commanded a curse upon the snake. He lost his legs. Had to crawl on his belly. Amen. Now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Has God indeed said you should not eat of every tree of the garden? Now, now notice that. What did God say? 
Look at verse 15. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree in the garden you may freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day you eat of it, and dying you shall surely die. That's what God said. So what's the devil doing here? Has God indeed said? Did God really say that? Huh? Did God really say that? Did he really say, you shall not eat of every tree of the garden? Huh? Oh, come on. Did he really say that? Look at the woman's response. And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, You shall not eat of it, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. What's wrong with that statement? He didn't say anything about touching it. See, I'll tell you, when you add to God's word, you get in trouble. But you know, the devil knew he had her right there. Because see, when you start adding to God's word, See, somehow she had been thinking about that. Oh, I can't not only eat it, but I can't touch it either. God didn't say don't touch it. He just said don't eat of it. Oh boy, she's in trouble now. Amen. Now notice, notice the devil's reaction in verse 3. Or verse 4. Then the serpent said to the woman, you shall not surely die. Notice, notice he's changed tactics. He knows he's got the woman. Instead of, instead of creating doubt, he, he's making a bold statement. He, he, you shall not surely die. So he went from getting her to doubt what God said to now saying something completely opposite. The power of suggestion. Number one, you should never have conversations with the devil other than like what Jesus did when he had to converse with the legion when he cast them out of that maniac of Gadara. That's about it. Some people said, well, you know, the devil was talking to me. Who cares? He's a liar. What are you doing listening to him? Amen. Now, what's the problem with this whole thing right here? What's missing? Adam. Where in the world's Adam? Adam. Knock, knock, putting head. Why is he not speaking up? And the serpent said to them, You shall not surely die. For God knows that in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you'll be like God. Knowing good and evil. Now what's he playing on? Pride. See, God just doesn't want you to eat of it because he knows when you eat of it, you're going to be like him. Now what's the problem with that statement besides it being a bald-faced lie? There's a couple things wrong with it. First of all, he just out and out contradicts what God says. You shall not surely die. <laughs> God says, in the, the day you eat of it and dying, you shall surely die. Oh, yeah. That's what he said. Now he's just boldly, brassly contradicting what God said. And then he starts planting this thought. He starts planting the thought. Well, you know, the reason why God said not to eat of it is because he knows when you eat of it, you're going to be like him, knowing good and evil. 
What's the problem with that statement? You know, the problem with that statement is they're already as much like God in his image as they could possibly be. You know, God doesn't really know good and evil because God's, God knows about evil, but he doesn't know it. Who's the one who knows good and evil? The devil. You know what he's declaring? If you eat of that, you're going to be like me. I'm God. Just hold your place here in Genesis 3 and go to Isaiah 14. This is not the first time that the devil's made such a statement. Isaiah 14, verse 12. How you are fallen from heaven, O Lucifer. Of course, that's the name of the devil before he fell. How you are fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning. How you are cut down to the ground, you who weaken the nations. For you have said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will also sit in the mount of the congregation on the fire of the sides of the north. See, what's the devil doing? He sees God calling those things that don't exist as though they do, and he's trying to do that. What's the problem with this? He's not God. And he doesn't have the authority to make such a statement. But see, again, it's all about, I mean, you know, rock and roll and all the ungodly music, the devil receives all of that as worship. And now the, the lyrics are getting bold where they even talk about the devil in the lyrics. Amen. devil always overplays his hand. Go back to Genesis 3 now. God knows in the day that you eat of your eyes will be open, you'll be like God, knowing good and evil. So the woman, what? Verse 6. The woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was pleasant to the eyes. And a tree desirable to make one wise. And she took of the fruit and ate. And she gave it to her husband. What's the next two words? With her. Where in the world was Adam in all this? He should have rose up, used his authority. I've given you dominion over everything that creeps upon the earth. This is a creep. He should have been taking his dominion. If he'd have said, get out, stay out, he'd have had to go. But he didn't do nothing. He just, vocabulary of silence. And see, half the time, that's the problem with the church. All the crud is going on all over the United States of America. So many Christians are silent. And you got some knucklehead preachers that say we should, shouldn't be involved at all with any of the, you know, politics. Well, who in the world should be involved then? If we don't, the devil will. That's exactly what he's done. And now we've got to make sure we take it back in this election or we're going to be out facing some really nasty stuff. Amen. Thoughts become images or imagination. Turn to 2 Corinthians 10. 2 Corinthians 10. See, the devil whispered that stuff and she got a picture. Ooh, I could be like God. Oh. Verse 
but she didn't realize she already was as close as God could make her without her actually being God. She was made in the image of God. Adam was made in the image of God. They'd been managers of the, they'd been made managers of the earth. I mean, they were in the driver's seat. Everything was in perfection. They didn't have pain or sickness or poverty or lack or any of those things. Adverse circumstances, everything was perfect and And she ate them all out of house and home. Amen. Verse 3 of 2 Corinthians said, For though we walk in the flesh, in other words, we're in this physical body, we do not war according to the flesh. It's like Pastor Marine said earlier, you know, people say, well, I'm not into warfare. Well, whether you are or not, you're in it. Because you're in this earth. There's warfare. When you either are doing something to the devil or the devil's doing something to you and you are getting yourself beat up. Amen. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal or fleshly, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds. That's when the devil gets a stronghold on us, we can pull those things down. Notice, casting down arguments. King James says imaginations. And every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. See, that's all. And look what the devil did in this, this temptation. He, he endeavored to exalt their thinking above the knowledge of God. God had said, of every tree in the garden you may freely eat, but of the tree in the middle of the garden you may not eat of it, and the day you eat of it and dying you should surely die. And he perverted what God said. He got them to have a picture that went above what God said. We don't ever want to be below what God said because that's the other. We just want to be right where God said. God said, you can eat of every tree in the garden. But the tree in the middle of the garden, don't eat of it. Amen. Casting down imaginations. And every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every what? Thought into captivity to what? Obedience of Christ. Now notice the next verse. And being ready to punish all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. Once you got your thinking right, the devil's not going to stop, folks. Just because you got your mind renewed, you cannot relax. You know, when, when Jesus appeared to Brother Hagin in 1952 and said, I'm going to teach you about dealing with the devil and evil demons and evil spirits, he showed Brother Hagin, reminded him of a pastor and his wife. And uh, they said, you know, Brother Hagin said he'd met him only like one time. Shook their hand. He had seen this woman. She had a beautiful voice. Had sang at some of the gatherings for their particular denomination. And he saw in this vision this woman. And he saw this woman and, and, and this woman... You know, he said that she was exceptionally beautiful. She was just one of those head turners. You know, just, you know, you know, some people have it. And when they have it, it just, he said not only men would look when she'd walk by, but women would too. It was just one of those very outstanding. But the pastor was pastoring in a very small town at a church of about 200. And, um, and uh, so one day, Brother Hagin saw this demon, said he looked about the size of a monkey, looked a little bit like a monkey, came and sat on her shoulder, whispered to her and said, you know, you're really beautiful. And you're wasting your life here. You are wasting your beauty here. You could 
be, you could have fame and fortune and wealth. And she recognized it as the devil and said, get thee behind me, Satan, leave now. And he left. And he saw it was some time later. The same devil came, sat on her shoulder. You're really beautiful. You're wasting your life here. You could have fame and fortune, wealth. You could do so much better. Get thee behind me, Satan. Get out of here. And he left. Third time, some months later, the devil came back. The same demon came back, sat on her shoulder, and whispered the same thing to her. But he said this time, instead of rebuking him, she entertained it. Started thinking on what he had said started and he said that he saw as she entertained it he saw that demon go from just sitting on her shoulder to becoming this black dot in her mind and started ruling her thoughts and she left her husband the pastor went off and sang at nightclubs and was with other men, sometimes even five at a time. Amen. And Jesus came to her, came to, or spoke to Brother Hagin, said, you know, even when she's had five men at a time, because the, 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 that demon was still up in her, in her mind. He said, you know, if she would turn and she would repent and ask me to forgive, rebuke the devil, I would set her free and receive her back and forgive her sin. But she kept on. She kept on. And then not only did she, you know, leave her husband, she started uh, persecuting her husband, causing trouble. And, uh, and so the superintendent of this particular Pentecostal denomination went to try to talk to her, knew, found out where she was, went to go talk to her. She came to the door, answered the door, and her dress was wide open. Nothing on underneath. And when she saw who it was, she started cussing him a blue streak. Just cussed him up one side and down the other. He couldn't even get a word. Judge why he had to turn around and walk away. Amen. And later on, then Brother Hagen saw that demon go from her head to her heart. And later on, he heard her die and her screams as she went into hell. It is not impossible to lose your salvation. It's difficult, but not impossible. We have to guard our minds. Amen. And I'm not saying that to make you afraid because I think you have to work at it. But I mean, you know, she really, she knew better. She, she had been well taught. She wasn't some baby Christian. Amen. And so we have to guard our minds. Bring every thought, wrong thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. And then verse 6, having a readiness to avenge any disobedience once your obedient thinking is established. Amen. So we've got to watch out. If you are... If, if the devil can get you into the mental realm, he could defeat you. Number two, the third, third realm is the emotional realm. You know, emotions are great. Jesus had them and operated in them, but he was ruled by none of them. Anybody know the shortest verse in the Bible? Jesus wept, John eleven thirty five. 35. 
You know, at Lazarus' tomb, he, he showed emotion. He was moved by Mary and Martha. He loved them. I mean, he, he, he had developed a friendship with Lazarus and with Mary and Martha, and he wept. But notice, he did not stay in that realm. He moved from that realm and raised Lazarus from the dead. You're not going to do that in the emotional realm. You're going to do it in the spiritual realm. So he didn't stay there. He wasn't ruled by his grief or sorrow. He moved back into the spiritual realm, raised Lazarus from the dead. You know, I'm a really tender-hearted guy. I can weep at a poignant movie moment, but I refuse to be ruled by emotion. I'm glad I'm, I'm tender-hearted. You know, some guys are so hard-hearted, oh, that's a bunch of junk. You know, you know we're taught from a little, thing. boys don't cry. Well, not necessarily. Jesus, was, was he not a man? Well, he was a man's man, but he wept. Amen. See, you can have emotion. You can have the emotion of anger, but not be ruled by it. Remember Ephesians 4.26? Be angry and sin not. You know, Jesus was angry when he took the whip into the money changers in the temple turned over their tables and took the whip to them, drove them all out. He was angry. My father's house shall be called a house of prayer. You made it a den of thieves. He was angry. But he wasn't ruled by it. God gets angry. During the tribulation, God's going to be pouring out 2,000 years of stored up anger on the ungodly. And they deserve every bit of it. Amen. We can have sorrow because of losing a loved one, but not sorrow as the world does. Turn to 1 Thessalonians 4. Verse 13. But I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep. That's physically died lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. See, we're not like the world. They have no hope. Well, we do. Amen. 2 Corinthians 7. Look at verse 10. For godly sorrow produces repentance leading to salvation, not to be regretted. But the sorrow of the world works death. You can't wallow in the sorrow of the world. That's why sometimes you see these elderly couples, one of them dies and about three months later the other one dies. Why? They, they wallow in the sorrow of the world. It kills them. Works death in them. Amen. We can enjoy a wide gamut of emotions. This makes us able to enjoy life, but we're not to be ruled by any one of them. Amen. And then finally, the last realm I want to talk about is the realm of the five senses. The physical realm. The realm of the five senses. 2 Corinthians 5, 7. For we walk by faith and not by sight or by the five senses. Kenneth Hagin said, if Satan can draw you into the sense realm, he'll defeat you every time. So in other words, either the sense or the mental realm, you can be you'll be defeated. If you stay there, if he can draw you there, he can defeat you every time. Why is that? Why can he defeat us in those realms? That's where he operates. He can manipulate those realms. He can manipulate the scene realm. He can manipulate the, your thoughts if you let him. But what about the faith realm? He can't touch that unless you let him. Amen. That's why he hates people who walk by faith. Amen. The reason we walk by faith and not by sight, the five senses, is because it is the realm in which Satan can manipulate more than any other. 
He can also manipulate you in the emotional realm. He can manipulate you in the mental realm. But he can really work in the seen realm. He can manipulate how you feel. He can manipulate what you see. He can manipulate what you hear. He can manipulate what you taste. He can even manipulate what you smell. Amen. If we walk by the mental, emotional, or five senses, Satan can and does manipulate what goes on in those realms. But he can't manipulate the faith in your spirit and he can't stop faith from coming from your mouth. The devil can't make you do anything. Back in the 1970s, there was a black comedian named Flip Wilson. Anybody ever seen Flip Wilson? Okay, some of you. He coined a phrase. Anybody remember what what was one of his favorite phrase? The devil made me do it. In fact, actually a friend of my my brother's that was in his grade had a t-shirt that, you know, in, in, in... from large print to smaller print, it was about 20 times on the front of the t-shirt. The devil made me do it. 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 What's the problem with that? The devil can't make you do anything. You have to allow him to manipulate you. Amen. The great Indiana preacher, Lester Sumrall, used to visit the great English preacher, Smith Wigglesworth, while on an extended time in England. Once while visiting Smith, he happened to ask him that day how he was feeling. And Smith rose up. He said, very curtly replied, I never asked Smith how he is feeling. I tell him how he's feeling. Lester said, I never asked that question again. We need to tell ourselves how we're doing, how we're feeling according to the word of God. You know that song, last song we sang, even if we can't feel it, he's working. Even if we can't see it, he's working. Even if we can't Think it in our mind. He's still working. We should be thinking it because our mind should be renewed. So the realm of faith causes us to rise above these other three realms where the devil can manipulate. Amen. So we're going to walk by faith and not by sight. Amen. I'm going to go ahead and receive our offering tonight. Praise God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. I'm going to go ahead and pray. Father, we just thank you so much for this offering. Thank you, Lord, for being so good. Thank you, Lord, for directing us now in our giving. We walk by faith and not by our five senses, by our mental realm or our emotions. We give by grace through faith. We thank you now for grace to give tonight. In Jesus' name, and everybody agree to that said, amen. If you make out a check tonight, make it out to Eternity Church or Market EC. If you're giving cash, on a tax deductible receipt, raise your hand. One of the ushers will give you an envelope. Just keep your hand up until they get to you. I want to thank everybody who signed up to be a volunteer for Faith Fest, that's coming up fast. Amen. Um, I was talking with Scott Richards, and he said that people are slowing down by their yard because they got a sign out by the end of their driveway, and, and so they're slowing down to read the sign. Glory to God. So, that's a good thing. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. And if you haven't volunteered yet, you can still volunteer. It's possible. Um, But you're going to have to contact me, and I'll get you in contact with the director, Myla, and she'll help get you plugged in wherever you can help. 
Amen. And if you missed the training, we did record it so you can watch it. And uh, so it'd be good for you to watch that so you're cued in. And uh, the specific area, you didn't get a chance to probably find out much because that was not recorded. But you can, if you can get there early that day from the time that you're scheduled, you can get there and they'll help clue you in on what, what you're supposed to be doing. <clears throat> Amen. Anyone else need an envelope for cash giving? All, let's all stand then. Praise God. Say it out. I'll say, Heavenly Father, bring my tithes, give my offerings, because I dare to believe you. I dare to act on your word. I dare to walk by faith and not by sight, not by my mind, not by my emotions, but by faith. And my faith causes me to overcome the world. As I give, it is given back to me. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over. Abundance is coming to me. Overflow is coming to me. More than enough is coming to me. The blessings of God are coming upon me and chasing me down. In Jesus' name. Amen. You may be